So my talk today is about the relationship between the past, present, and future, and the role of history in mediating between the past, present, and future. These quotations in the first slide of my presentation I will return to later on because they give us some insight into what history is and how it functions in the world. Now, without denying the factuality of actual events, history is very malleable. It can be changed. Um, and this is demonstrated by the many ways in which the canon of our history, the narratives of the history of art, have been written and rewritten in, uh, from different perspectives, um, in changing perspectives. When I was a student in uh, college, the art history book that we used, Jansen's History of Art, had no women in it. And that has changed, but it only changed because art historians and artists like Linda Knopflin, uh, who wrote a wonderful article called Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists, and artists like Carolee Schneemann and Judy Chicago and others, they insisted that the history of art needed to include women. And they were uh, compelling enough and assertive enough that the history of art had to change. And so now there are many great women artists included in the history of art, such as Artemisia Gentileschi, the great 17th century painter. Uh, and this sort of logic can be applied not just to women artists, but to uh, what happened to artists from different parts of the country. So I don't think there were any Brazilian artists in Jansen's history of art. But hopefully, as people make uh, more research on the history of art and they make compelling cases, the history of art will be more inclusive and include more artists from Brazil, Latin America, other parts of the world that were not so, so much attention was not paid to in the past. And that needs to be corrected. But I think that this malleability of history, um, history is not just out there waiting to be discovered. I think that history is really an ongoing process of interpretation and negotiation. And those negotiations are um, often very passionate arguments. Because what is at stake are not simply matters of fact, but systems of belief. Uh, in the example I gave, a system of belief in which it was okay for the history of art to be composed solely of male arts, a patriarchal view of the world, as opposed to a more inclusive view of the world that recognizes the importance of including artists of whatever gender they happen to be. The malleability of history, its ability to change, is, I think, a two-way street, forwards and backwards. Every now, every present, arguably constructs an alternative then, an alternative history. Just as every then alternative history constructs or demands a different conception, an alternative now, a different conception of the present. So every now and then establishes a particular foundation for imagining the future. This inevitably affects the nows and thens to be, the presents and the histories that we will write in the future. So by reconceptualizing the past, we gain a different conception of ourselves in the present. And this establishes a different foundation for envisioning the future. Um, and I think it, it's in this future-oriented spirit 
that I approach writing and rewriting the history of art. When I began uh, my research as an art historian in 1993, it was at the, the very cusp of really dramatic changes in technology and popularization of technology. CD-ROMs had just been, interactive CD-ROMs had just come on the market. Real technological changes. More powerful, affordable, personal computing. The World Wide Web, Mosaic, was released in 1993. And so I recognized that this was an important moment in the future of art. Uh, and I envisioned, well, by the time I completed my PhD in 2000, 2000 or so, year 2000 was just on the horizon, that this was going, that the, the world of art would be really transformed. And it's happened much more slowly than I anticipated. But we do see it changing, and we see these changes seeping through popular culture. Um, the possibility of my having this conference with you uh, in 1993, it was possible. But I would have had to have gone to a special video conferencing laboratory or room at a university or a uh, business. I couldn't have done it from my father's home, as we're doing now. Uh, and these things really change the way we interact with people, the sorts of communities, the types of sociality um, that, that emerge. It's not just based on geographic proximity, but based on affinities of interest. We all share some common interests, even though we approach them from different disciplinary methods and, and attitudes. But we can come together and share ideas, even though we're geographically very far apart, right? OK. So in terms of writing history, and history is an academic discipline, um, academic writing follows really a very simple formula. And this is a bit oversimplified, but it, it really is the essence of it. You identify a problem, you discuss what other people have said about the problem, the literature, and then you articulate your own original perspective and argue in support of it. That's really all there is to academic writing. But it's not that easy. Um, coming up, sorry, I went too far. Coming up, with, um, coming up with an idea that you think is original and really interesting and compelling can sometimes seem like a gift from above. I don't really have a great idea every day. I feel lucky if I have a great idea, well, ever. Um, and then, even if you have a great idea, convincing others that one's idea, that one's position, is worth considering can be extraordinarily difficult, a really big challenge. And I think that that challenge is proportionate to how far that position, that idea, diverges from the status quo. It's much easier to convince people of something that's close to what they already believe. But if you're trying to convince them about something that is very different from what they already believe, it's very, very difficult. But that's precisely what is required in order to influence people, in effect, to alter history. You have to convince people that your perspective is valuable and worth them changing their minds about something. Or expanding their minds about something. So why bother? Well, others' ideas expand my understanding of the world. And they make my life more meaningful and awesome in the most literally sense, literal sense, filled with awe. And that's been my experience as a scholar learning about things, as a student, having my eyes opened by people, new ideas. And I hope to have the same effect on others. I hope that the ideas I'm sharing with you will help expand your conception of at least history and art history and what it is and how it functions. 
and maybe what you can do uh, as scholars in your own right. But my idealism goes even further. For I believe that if we know more, are open to alternative worldviews, and can understand others' perspectives, then perhaps we can be more sensitive, tolerant, and embracing of others. And the more we can embrace other individuals and cultures, the more difficult it becomes to harm each other, and the more um, the easier it becomes to reconcile our differences in a mutually beneficial way. So, although I can find very little concrete evidence in support of um, this belief, uh, I think that my commitment to this way of thinking was reinforced uh, some years ago when I heard Philippe de Montebello, the former director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, state very similar beliefs in a talk. This was around 2007. So I think that, um, in fact, if we can be more tolerant of other, embrace each other's perspectives, then maybe we can contribute to a more peaceful world. And it seems clear to me that regardless of our differences, whether they be linguistic, cultural, uh, political, ideological, the interconnectedness of markets and the global perils of climate change make it pretty clear that we are all in this together. So I think it's important for us to try to um, make more common shared understandings, to open our minds uh, and expand our attitudes to be more embracing of others. And I think that art can play a vital role in this. Okay, so now we'll shift to it. The cynical and cheeky quotations uh, in my first slide, repeated here by Voltaire, Twain, Churchill, and Alan Kay, they recognize some of the problems with constructing historical narratives, with how history is shaped. Um, but in contrast to Churchill's claim, history will be kind to me for I intend to write it, I ask, can we envision a history that will be kind to the world? Well, Alan Kay says that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. We might ask, rather, can we envision a more peaceful future by reinventing history? If we rewrite the past, perhaps that can provide a present from which we can envision a more peaceful future. In what follows, I shall outside outline some of the strategies that I have employed in my own work uh, to write and rewrite history. The strategies I'll focus on uh, have a lot to do with questioning categories and boundaries, especially distinctions based on binary oppositions, good, evil, white, black. Um, I think oppositions that dissolve in a country like Brazil, which is so mixed, so blended in a beautiful way. These strategies will be illustrated with examples from my own work on the history of art and technology. Um, so, for example, my, my essay, Art and the Information Age, from 2001, tried to look down the categorical boundaries between the history of art and technology and the history of conceptual art. My book, Art and Electronic Media, uh, my more current research on bridging the gap between mainstream contemporary art and new media art, MCA and NMA, uh, and a new book forthcoming in Spanish, Portuguese, and Chinese called Inventing the Future. Uh, and uh, my online companion to art and electronic media.
um, I will analyze my, so this is a very self-reflexive talk because I will be analyzing my own work simplifications in terms of the idealistic aims uh, I mentioned earlier about world peace and, and uh, being all in this all together. And I'll frame this all within the context of how each present demands a reconfiguration of history and how the revision of history helps enable new possibilities for the future. So my essay, Art in the Information Age, questions categorical divisions that obscure parallels and continuities between different forms, well, between forms of practice that have been written in history as categorically distinct. So the, the strategy is to look at something that's been created as different and see continuities and parallels between them. And by doing that, uh, hopefully offer a more uh, inclusive and comprehensive understanding of history. And one of my strategies for historical revision concerns this questioning of categorical revisions. And I think it's important to make distinctions, to make divisions, that it's, uh, otherwise everything becomes undifferentiated, a muddle. At this time, distinctions and boundaries and definitions need to be scrutinized with respect to the motivations behind them and the potential violence that they impose on people, places, and ideas that are prejudiced against get the short end of the stick, that are not included, that are set off somewhere else. As sociologist Thomas Guerin has written, boundary work is strategic practical action. Borders and boundaries will be drawn to pursue immediate goals and interests and to appeal to the goals and interests of certain audiences and stakeholders. Uh, Gearing continues, quoting Pierre Bourdieu, he notes that such boundaries constitute ideological strategies and epistemological positions whereby agents aim to justify their own position and the strategies they use to maintain or improve it, while at the same time discrediting the holders of the opposing position and strategy. You can see this applied in the, the first example I gave, the feminist revision of the history of art. There is a certain belief system that asserts its boundaries and another belief system that wants to challenge those boundaries and change those distinctions. And there is a process of negotiation over these ideological positions, these epistemological positions, and it's a battle. It's an argument. There's a fight. Not everyone believes the same thing, but eventually something happens and it either changes or it doesn't change. And in this case, it changed. And I would say very much for the better. But it's, it's not just a matter of fact that's being argued over. It's a matter of ideology. So, as an example of putting these ideas into art historical practice in my own work, my essay, Art in the Information Age, Technology and Conceptual Art, questions the sharp distinctions between conceptual art and art and technology in the 60s. Uh, to this end, I analyze some of the ideological factors underlying how and why these practices became historicized, written in history, as discrete. And I focus on uh, the 1970 exhibition, Software Information Technology, It's New Meaning of Art, curated by Jack Burnham. How many of you, can you raise your hands, how many of you know who Jack Burnham is? Have you read any Jack Burnham? No. I don't see any hands. Okay. So, in my mind, Jack Burnham was the most important champion 
of art and technology in the 60s. He wrote a fascinating book called Beyond Modern Sculpture in 1968, which is really a history of art and technology, a history of art becoming ever more lifelike. And while one can criticize it on the basis of its teleology, so it's, it proposes that art becomes, it's moving towards a certain endpoint, we can be critical of that. Some of his analysis and his historical research is extraordinary. And to reread that book today, it is still sparkling, still full of bright, brilliant ideas. It's really, really an extraordinary book, and I, I recommend it for anyone interested in contemporary practices involving art and technology. He was invited to organize an exhibition at the Jewish Museum in New York in 1970. And this was known as the Software Exhibition. The Jewish Museum in New York was one of the leading venues for experimental art in the world, uh, in a certain world at that time. And he organized this exhibition called Software. The exhibition was predicated on the notion of software as a metaphor for art that consists primarily of ideas as opposed to the materiality hardware that characterized formless aesthetics. So Burnham, he had a wonderful, uh, another sort of metaphor. Software is the ideas behind the art. And this was at the moment also the emergence of conceptual art, which also emphasized the ideas of art rather than its formal, material, concrete presence. Uh, not so much about uh, stone or paint or uh, materials, but about the ideas behind it. He likened, uh, if you know uh, Alice in Wonderland, there's a question. Can you raise your hand? Question? No, the video will allow you to use it just for a okay. second. It's fine. In Alice in Wonderland, the story by Lewis Carroll, there's the Cheshire Cat. And the Cheshire Cat appears just as the grin, just as the smile. See the rest of the cat, just the smile. Are you familiar with this? Yes. Yes, okay. So Jack Burnham drew a parallel between the grin of the cat, the Cheshire cat, and conceptual art. Alice says, uh, a grin without the cat, that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. I've seen a cat without a grin, but a grin without the cat, that's really... So Jack Burnham thought of conceptual art as like the grin without the cat, the idea of the art without the actual physical embodiment. And so the software exhibition was an effort to examine the conceptual aspects of art. It's software, uh, as opposed to it's just it's hardware. But to really problematize that in very interesting ways. The exhibition included works of conceptual art by people like Joseph Kasuth, technological works of art, such as Ted Victoria's solar audio window installation, and works of technology that were not created to be works of art, per se, such as uh, the work Seat, created by Nicholas Negroponte and the Architecture Machine Group at MIT. The Architecture Machine Group was sort of the foundations of what became the Media Labs. And this is a fascinating installation that had live gerbils in it. And it was a reconfigurable environment. So based on the behavior of the jerks in this environment, it was kept track of by a computer. There was a robotic arm that moved the cubes around in the installation. And it changed the environment. So we can imagine this as a prototype for a reconfigurable human environment. The environment could reconfigure itself to be more efficient, to be more pleasing, to be however you want to reconfigure. The solar audio window installation by Ted Victor, and this is one of the things that I find so 
rewarding in my work. No one knows about Ted Victoria's solo audio window installation. It's been buried in the rubbish heap of history. But by going back and reviewing some of that, that rubbish heap, one finds fabulous gems, beautiful works of art that have just been forgotten. Or maybe they weren't really recognized for how brilliant they were at the time. This piece used solar power to give energy to a series of radios tuned into different channels in New York City. And then the sound output onto uh, transducers, uh, little uh, speakers that were on the windows of the museum turning those windows into speakers. But you had to get very close to the windows to hear them. So it, pre it turned the museum itself into a mission machine, this solar-powered information system. Really a brilliant work. And I'll talk at greater length about Kasu's seventh investigation, Arna's idea, this idea. Uh, this work appeared uh, in many in many forms. It was part of the software exhibition, even though it was displayed as a um, oh. Okay. So software questioned the categorical boundaries between these various artistic practices and non-artist practices. Conceptual art and art and technology uh, are seen as aesthetic manifestations of the information age, not as so discrete, but as sharing commonalities of a larger social formation, larger cultural shifts in society. And, and Burnham didn't distinguish between works of art, works of technology, conceptual art, art technology, without joining them all together to see the parallels between them. I think brilliant uh, curatorial ambition. So, uh, the suit seventh investigation was part of the exhibition, even though it was not in the exhibition physically, it was a billboard in Chinatown, downtown Manhattan. It consists of a set of six propositions. And I think that these propositions are like instructions. They're almost like software. So I'll read them and allow them to just sort of be instructions to your mind. Assume a mental set voluntarily. Shift voluntarily from one aspect of the situation to another. Keep in mind simultaneously various aspects. Grasp the essential of a given whole. Break up a given whole into parts and isolate them voluntarily. Generalize, abstract common properties. Plan ahead, ideally. Assume an attitude toward the mere possible. And work, uh, I'm sorry, and think or perform symbolically. Detach your ego from the outer world. So, software suggested a parallel between the way the computer software instructs the organization or the operation of hardware that runs and how aesthetic information, how art, affects the activity of the human mind. So in this, in this sense, I interpret Kasu's propositions as operating like instructions or software in the hardware of the viewer's mind. Uh, but whereas computer software has a very instrumental relationship with respect to coordinating the operation of hardware, the processor, the artist's proposition function more as meta-analyses of the phenomenological and linguistic components of meaning. So, in other words, we experience this while in the process of doing it. It has a meta-analytic quality. They demand that we, the viewer, examine the process of processing information while in the process of doing so. As we 
perform these acts in our mind. We think about what it is to perform those acts. So we're processing the process while doing it. I think that that metacritical thing that uh, computers are not quite able to do yet. Although Kasuth did not draw on computer models of information processing explicitly, his investigations, his work of art, follows a logic that shares affinities with that model, while at the same time demanding a level of self-reflexivity that goes beyond it. I claim that this critical attitude can be seen as constitutive of the social transformations that characterize information age in general. And in the shift from an industrial to a post-industrial economic base. In the information age, semantic meaning and material value are not embedded in objects, institutions, or individuals so much as they are abstracted in the production, manipulation, and distribution of signs. Uh, and I think that this is represented in some ways in the change, for example, in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It used to be big manufacturing companies, automobile companies, steel manufacturing, things like that. And now a lot of the members of the Dow Jones Industrial Average they're not those sort of industrial corporations. They're companies that make software, like Microsoft. We've seen a shift uh, during the global economic crisis, where those, those sorts of uh, software industries, service industries, were hit very hard. And it was more the uh, brick countries, countries like Brazil and China, uh, we're actually making things, making stuff that is bought and sold, commodities, that can be economically. So it's not as though uh, industrial production is uh, insignificant in the information age. It's very significant. But rather, I think there's a shift in values because the great fortunes that have been made uh, in the last 10 or 20 years have been largely in information industries. Think about the largest company in the Apple computer. Yeah, they make computers, they make iPods, they make things like that, but they're involved in information. Those um, things uh, are valuable because of what they do. They process information and they would be useless without the software. So I claim that this critical attitude uh, this shift to away from objects into information, to ideas, away from forms, is uh, is uh, really characteristic of our time. These past cultural and social changes have theoretical roots in cybernetics, information theory, and systems theory, emerging in the forties and fifties. 1940s and 1950s, and in the technological manifestations of those theories in digital com uh, computing and telecommunications, which reached popular audiences in the 80s and increasingly in the 90s and the 2000s, which has become really a global phenomenon. Uh, by interpreting conceptual art and art and technology, as reflections and manifestations and constituents of the information age, I conclude that the two share, uh, the two tendencies share important similarities and that the com this common ground offers very useful insights into a more comprehensive and inclusive understanding of contemporary art. So by dissolving the boundaries between these practices and seeing commonalities as part of larger social formations, I think we can have a more comprehensive understanding of artists. This is not an attitude that's shared by a lot of art historians, unfortunately. So it's my job to try to convince people of this.
Um, and it's not an easy, easy thing to do. Because it's a difference of ideology, not just a difference of ideology. Now getting back to the overall theme of my talk, the writing and reading free, and doing this so my utopian goals of making life more meaningful and hoping, uh, helping to cultivate world peace. Well, an essay like Art and the Information Age admittedly will not take us very far. But I do think that its implications extend beyond the debates contemporary art. If my work and scholarship in general can offer models for successfully questioning and thinking across categorical boundaries in general. And if other work like that can do the same, then perhaps it can contribute to advancing larger idealistic goals. Uh, one of the things that uh, we hear often is that scientists and technologists, there was a case in the mid 90s, late 90s, when Bill Joy, one of the founders of Sun Microsystems, wrote a very impassioned letter in Wired magazine saying he had this awakening where he realized that he'd spent his career as a captain of the technology industry and that what he had accomplished was actually something that could be very destructive. And it was wonderful that he had this awakening but one of the problems was that during the course of his education as an electrical engineer, he had not studied really anything except electrical engineering. And if he'd read, for example, Jack Burnham's Beyond Modern Sculpture, he might have had a very different attitude towards technological development and the potential destructiveness of a society, a culture that was based on scientific rationality. Uh, and instrumental relationships between humans and technology. So hopefully these sorts of ideas, if they can be uh, more widespread throughout culture, if people can think beyond categorical, categorical boundaries and see parallels between things as part of larger social formations, then maybe this can uh, bode well for uh, the larger idealistic goals that I, I inspire to. So I'm fascinated by the entwinement of art, science, and technology, and especially the relationship between new media, art, and visual culture. And when I use the term new media, it's a really, it's an unfortunate term because it's not, it's not really new. It's stuff that began being developed in the 40s. But I use it in the sense that there is a literature of new media theory, a wonderful collection of historic essays called The New Media Reader, published by M.T., edited by Noah Wardrup-Fruin and Nick Montfort. And it's there's a a field of study called new media, new media research, new media studies, new media theory. I've taught in a new media theory department. Um, so I use it in that sense of uh, a set of practices, technologies, ideas, and theories that emerged uh, alongside the advent of digital computing, connected to information theory and cybernetics uh, and uh, systems theory. So, this area of artistic practice connected to new media has expanded my understanding of the world, making my life, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, more meaningful and awesome. And I'm going to share these amazing works of art and ideas with others in the hope that it will make their lives more meaningful and awesome. Given this commitment, I've been really frustrated by the exclusion of this field of practice by mainstream art history, by the art historical canon. For example, the book Art Since 1900, 
written by Hal Foster, Rosalind Krauss, Eva Watt, and Benjamin Buchloh. Uh, these are arguably the most powerful contemporary art historians in the world. Um, they are so unknowledgeable about or antagonistic to any sort of art that happens to use technological media, besides maybe video, that even the most major monuments in the discourses of media art history, such as Billy Kluver and EAT, are ignored. So this canonical art history excludes a whole area of practice, in fact, the whole area of practice that I'm interested in, the whole area of practice that I think all of you are interested in. So Billy Kluber is not mentioned. Nothing about Robert Rauschenberg's involvement with art and technology in the 60s is a key figure. Um, and I, I suppose that uh, if Billy Kluver and EAT are unfamiliar to you, it's not your fault, but it rather demonstrates the problem. People who should know these things and have the authority and the responsibility for disseminating that knowledge have failed to do so. My recent book, Art and Electronic Media, is essentially a canonical history of the dynamic and rapidly moving area of artistic activity that has been largely ignored by the likes of Foster, Krauss, and so forth. It attempts to enable the rich genealogy of art and technology in the 20th century and beyond to be understood and seen, literally and figuratively, as central to the histories of art and visual culture. While writing this book, I felt a profound sense of responsibility to do justice to the material and to represent the breadth of the field and its theoretical discourses as fairly yet rigorously as possible. And there were a lot of challenges, a lot of questions I asked myself. How do I, for example, represent the global uh, uh, practice the history of art and technology. This is happening all over the world uh, since mid-century. How do I represent uh, women as opposed to men in this history? How do I represent the work of an artist, Nam June Pike or Roy Ascot, who have many decades of working in the field in relation to uh, younger artists whose uh, made valuable contribution, but whose contribution to the field over a career has not been demonstrated. These are very difficult questions, and I tried to be as inclusive as possible. I organized the book in seven thematic streams because I didn't want it to be de defined by any particular sort of medium or technology. I didn't want it to be strictly chronological. I wanted to emphasize media and I concepts across time, so it's not organized by media. I, I, because I wanted to emphasize continuity in the use of media over time, different uh, aspects of it. Artists, designers, engineers, and institutions from more than 30 countries are represented. Uh, and I thought it was important to demonstrate the role of institutions in the formation of this field. Important institutions like Ars Electronica, founded in 1979, or the journal Leonardo, which has done so much to provide a forum for scholarly discourses at the intersections of art and science. I don't think we can think about this field in terms of just artists, but also the important roles of designers and engineers, uh, people like Billy Coover, who were instrumental to the history of this field. I didn't want to uh, I, uh, 
the pigeonhole race or gender or sexuality. So I wove it into the narrative fabric of the book. Um, and I wanted to demonstrate that art is continuous with and contingent upon other disciplines and factors that are external to it, like funding and institutions. And to demonstrate that this is a global and inclusive phenomenon. So I don't remember how many Brazilian artists are included. Uh, certainly few. Eduardo Katz, uh, Mario Ramirez, uh, Ramiro, uh, a couple others. Uh, and several other artists from uh, But not enough. And that's due to my lack of knowledge. So one of my desires in, in coming and meeting with all of you and spending more time in Brazil is to learn more firsthand about the history and current practice of new media art uh, in Brazil so that my own knowledge is broader and so that I can share a more comprehensive, more global, more inclusive understanding of this field with other people in the future. I also try to, in this book, flatten market-based understandings of art history by including blue-chip contemporary artists like Bruce Nauman, Jenny Holzer, and Oliver Eliasson with artists who are extraordinarily well-known in uh, electronic art, like Lynn Hirschman, Stellar, and Paul de Marinas, but who would not appear in, say, art since 1900. So these really remarkable works with Hirschman, Cyber Roberta, a telerobotic doll that builds on a history of her own formative work since uh, 1969, when she began her Roberta Brightmore performance. Stellark's remarkable piece, Hands Writing, where with his third hand, he's trained himself to write with his two born hands and his robotic third hand, the word evolution, simultaneously. Or Paul de Marinus's wonderful Edison effect in which he shines a laser beam through a fishbowl onto an Edison cylinder, reading the analog information encoded in it in the 19th century with digital and laser technologies and analog to digital uh, transformations to reproduce that sound, interrupted by the by the swimming fish in this fishbowl. Uh, in this page spread from the book, see how Rebecca Horn, famous blue chip artist, her fabulous kinetic sound piece, Concert for Anarchy, hanging in a tick monitor, is shown next to. Rafael Lozano Hemmer's Vectorial Elevations Relational Architecture Number no. 4 in the Zocalo Square in Mexico City. So trying to draw parallels between these, these blue chip artists and lesser known artists who were really key figures in the history of art technology. So, this effort to try to cut across these things, to draw parallels between mainstream contemporary art practices and blue chip artists who use electronic media and lesser known artists who are key figures in the field and to try to create an inclusive history that is broadly global in its representation. The, the, uh, the number of women included, it was very difficult to find uh, examples of extraordinary work by women artists in the 60s and 70s, although there are some really important examples, people like Lynn Hirschman, Sonia Sheridan, uh, Marta Mnuchin, uh, and others. But increasingly, women came to represent a much larger percentage of the artists in the 90s and, and uh, early 2000s. And now I think it's, it's almost equal. Reflecting on this in terms of uh, my larger ideological aims, 
it's hard to see any tangible gains towards forwards. I'd be highly gratified just to know that I turned some people on to ideas that help make the world more meaningful, if not awesome, for them. That must be a positive thing, I think, in, uh, uh, in a larger sense. Moreover, if the book can help shake off prejudices against the explicit use of technological media in and as art, if it can play a role in a canonical revision that overcomes some of those exclusions from art history that we see in the book of art since 1900, that it may also make possible alternative futures that are less ideologically constricted, that are more inclusive, more comprehensive. And I think that that scenario has good possibilities for my more idealistic aims. Now, I recognize and embrace the fact that my account of our history will be contested and rewritten. This is inevitable, and I support it. And in fact, I want to facilitate that process and to allow others to participate in the construction of a dynamic, open-ended narrative. Um, and I want to increase the diversity of voices that contribute to history as it unfolds. In fact, I believe that the democratization of content production and dissemination is a hallmark of new media technologies, of network culture, and network cultural practices. And I think this is one of, most, one of the most exciting aspects of contemporary culture. So in order to facilitate this, I've created the Art and Electronic Media Online Companion, which you see a, a screenshot on the right. This enables the collective writing and rewriting of history. It, this is a, a Web 2.0 uh, resource. Anyone can register and create an account and create content and submit it for publication. It's accessible to anyone online. It enables, it, it expands the book uh, and can include a virtually infinite amount of multimedia content and enable the book to constantly be updated and grow instantly. Perhaps more importantly, the online companion is the only historical archive of new media art that allows users to create their own content. Uh, maximizing the diversity of perspectives that can contribute to defining and redefining the history of the field as it unfolds. I've found a very useful teaching tool. I use it in my courses, and students learn about the history of electronic art by writing their own entries, writing their own little histories, contributing to that history as it unfolds. The number of entries online quickly outnumbered the number of entries in the book. And I think that this demonstrates uh, a lesson in participatory culture and collective production, that two heads are greater than one, and a thousand heads are much greater than one. Students also uh, are motivated in their coursework because they realize that it'll be published. It'll have a life outside of the class itself. They can share it with family and friends. So I encourage other teachers and, to adopt it uh, and other app, also expanding the content, making the resource more valuable for everyone. Uh, okay, so I should mention that the underlying software is open source, so it can be used by anyone for their own purposes. It doesn't have to be just for electronic art, just for this one, one purpose. 
so there are no messy copyright issues to deal with there. And it can be easily modified to accommodate a broad range of uses that would benefit from user-generated multimedia online resources. So I've had a, a wonderful opportunity to share Art Electronic Media, the book, and the online companion with audiences around the world, um, as I am today with you in Rio. My spoken words have been simultaneously translated into languages including Spanish, Euskara, uh, and Catalan. Many members of those audiences, when I gave a talk like this, uh, shared this work in uh, Bilbao, uh, where the audience speaks Euskara. They may have been wondering how the online companion would be of any use to them. All of you, I imagine, are, are pretty fluent with English. You're listening to me speak to you in English, and you all spoke to me in English. So maybe it's not so important. But I think it's for people to be able to contribute to electronic culture, to network culture in their own native languages. And if you can't read English, you can't write English, then you are missing out on potential. Uh, one of the important critiques of the utopian claim that cyberspace is creating a global village is the fact that if you don't speak English, you're missing out on a lot of what's happening in cyberspace. Just as, since I don't really read Portuguese, I'm missing out on all the Portuguese content on the web. So, as I think I've demonstrated, I'm very committed to overcoming boundaries and maximizing diversity and correcting exclusions, including linguistic ones. And I'll show you how I'm trying to do that. In the spirit of creativity and generosity in a connected age, to use the words of uh, internet theorist Clay Shirky, the translators, editors, uh, designers, and artists of this book, Inventar el Futuro, uh, Inventing the Future in Spanish, Chinese, Portuguese, have contributed their work to create translations of my writing and I'm very grateful for the translators in Brazil who have created the Portuguese version uh, in order to connect with millions of readers excluded from the book Art and Electronic Media. Uh, so here's the um, page mock-up for the Portuguese version. Chinese version. This book will be released as a, as a low-cost book on demand title. Art Electric Media is $75. It's a very expensive hardback book. This will be very inexpensive. And I'm also releasing a free e-text version. So anyone who has access to the internet can access this book and the ideas in it for free. Our goal is to share knowledge about this fascinating field with a growing audience of artists, technologists, and scholars around the world and in their native tongues. In turn, oh, here we go. And here you see a page mock-up of the Spanish uh, online companion. So the online companion will be uh, upgraded and revised, so it will enable the creation of content in Spanish, Portuguese, and Chinese, and hopefully translations of that content as well. So people writing in her language will be able to share their content with other people in other languages. Um, it's the so this is a final compliment to inv inventing the future. 
because inventing the future is, is a relatively complex volume. But it's expanded through this online format, and there are a lot of links in the e-text that go directly to the online companion. And you can look through the online companion in whatever language you want to. If there's an entry in, in one language and not in another, you can see that. You can contribute a translation of it. You can create your own content in whatever language you choose. So I'm really excited uh, about the prospect of a dramatic increase in content diversity in the online companion through the addition of content in Chinese, Spanish, and Portuguese about this and institutions and engineers and collaborations in Asia and Latin America. So, um, if we look back over, oh, here we go. In, yeah, so we're, we're, we're providing these things for free, and we hope that readers will share it with others and contribute to the conversation by making and writing about electronic art and new media. So, the online companion If we look back over, oh, well that actually, I think that concludes my talk. Um, and I'm very interested to have a discussion with you, to get your ideas about uh, history, the writing of history, alternative ways of writing history, the collective writing of history the use of electronic media to facilitate that, um, network culture, uh, and your own practices and how that either corresponds with them or, or doesn't correspond with them. Particularly the, the situation in Brazil and how uh, this could be maximized in a Brazilian context. Idealistic, 
and, uh, and we share the same goals. I want to tell you we share the same goals and I want to check out all these uh, tools you, you have because maybe we can combine some of our proposals are in the same uh, direction. Uh, which uh, we want to to make these meetings and more meetings like that and making more people to talk about these exactly to to have this scene not uh, here is like um, still it is like an it is uh, I mean it, it's uh, in, in England or in uh, states where technology was um, accessible for many people since a very long while because here it's accessible I mean not uh, 10, 10 years start to be more and more accessible but it's still very uh, so um, yeah in fact uh, I, I would like to tell you this because we are talking about innovation all the time but uh, uh, the, the main problem we face is uh, to, to break the, the old pattern and this is for everyone. This is for everyone. I'm glad you talk about the women artists <laughs> because here we have uh, uh, we have an history like uh, many composers from from a long time. You couldn't you couldn't find them in the books. So this is what you were talking about. Uh, what are in the books? So uh, it's not. Um, it's not about uh, doing nice things, it's about uh, some power control of uh, what... Um, yes, so I, I, I would like to comment uh, this to you and uh, thank you very much for sharing the ideas. All right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your, your comments and I'd be very interested in working with you to join our ideas and our our idealistic visions of the future together. When I, when I first came to Brazil in 1989, I felt that, you can come up, I felt that there was so much potential, that Brazil was, you know, was a place where the future would, would come into being. And, um, there are ways that I can I can uh, contribute to that idealism and that building of the future. I'm, I'm happy to participate. I'll, I'll, stay. I'll stay here at uh, the place I was while you were talking because I think this is more natural and includes everybody. I felt it was strange to sit down on this chair there. Um, I, I really enjoyed very much your talking and I must thank Duda and Myra for inviting me here to listen to your work, there are a lot of visions uh, you presented that I share. Uh, but I, I would like just to question a little bit about your concept of peace. Is it a peace um, which involves uh, the idea of no w war with weapons, which I think everybody shares, or is it a peace in which we have a, a common sense which everybody shares and just one only a peaceful world which I think it's not only unattainable but undesirable because uh, I'm, we, I'm, to have, have, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh. I'm having trouble hearing you. Oh. You ask yes. I think we get a little feedback from the speakers, there's too much echo. Maybe it's better if you speak there. Not quite so close to the microphone. Do you listen to me if I talk from here? Do you listen yeah. better? Better. Okay. Better. Yes. So, uh, uh, from the no. beginning. What, yes. What, 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 you were asking, asking about my vision of the future. Is it one okay. thing or yeah. another thing? If you no, repeat yeah, what those concept, two this, things this concept, are. This concept of peace, I think it's a bit naive because uh, 
the richness of uh, our world depends on the on the plurality of visions and the tensions between these visions. So I think, uh, uh, of course, we want a world uh, without people killing each other. Okay. And there's a good art, John Godard film, when, in which he says uh, something that I like a lot. He says, to kill somebody to support an idea is to kill somebody, not to support an idea. So uh, uh, while we are able to talk and to discuss, we are more human. And while we are able to keep a dialogue, we are keeping our human condition alive. Uh, and when we kill somebody, we are a little less human. But the tensions between different world views and different uh, views of possible futures and different uh, utopias, maybe, I think this is vital, vital and necessary for a, a world uh, with vitality, a world in which we can discuss and share different perspectives of reality. I think uh, yes. a world of global just, uh, I think it's a little uh, platonic and I, I don't know what, it, it sounds a little tenuous for me. Right. No, thank you for your thank you for your comment, and I I agree with you. I think that a world without any sort of tension or conflict would be a very boring place. And I think that what makes innovation is often tension and conflict, disagreement that demands some sort of resolution that pushes things beyond the poles of a debate. So. Uh, when I say a more peaceful world, it's not a world without tension. It's not a world without contradiction. But it's a world that allows multiple voices to be heard uh, and provides a context for those voices to engage in discourse with each other, as you mentioned. So it's, it's a world that, um, it's not a world represented by the book Art Since 1900, which does not elect a voice to be heard. It's a world that includes different voices, allows them to debate with each other, and enables people to decide what they think. But it allows a certain level of parity, an equality of voices. Um, not a limiting of those voices. Because I think that if those voices are repressed, you end up with violence. You, you end up with a lack of peace. You need to allow the voices to be heard. And by allowing them to be heard and by being open to them, not just to let people talk, but to really listen to what they're saying in an open way, to be open to expanding one's perspective I think there, those are the two sides of it. You have to allow people to speak and you have to be receptive to what they have to say. Um, otherwise, the tensions don't get diffused in a constructive way. They get uh, uh, responded to in violent aggressiveness. There's a quote uh, by Merleau Ponty in which he says that the perception of the other is the foundation of morality. See, when you can perceive the other, uh, there's a level of violence which turns out to be impossible. So I think I uh, absolutely agree with you. Okay. Thanks, thank you. Uh, convinced that uh, media art and technological art are being exactly excluded. They, be, they may be excluded in the book in order because of course they are interested in developing uh, a certain view of history with privileges, a certain kind of art. This is obvious in the, the book you described it, and those critics uh, that have written it. But 
uh, I, uh, I don't uh, completely agree that even here in Brazil. Uh, I did not. I did not tell you the the many stories. Yeah. <laughs> not no, I, I know the difficulties. The difficulties that are that everybody has. Uh, me as also. I also work as an artist, and I have difficulties in producing. But I think that as a whole, technological art uh, corresponds to a deep change in culture uh, fostered by digital means and digital technology, and they are. Uh, Occupying a lot of space in contemporary culture, and also it's being done at, in a popular level. When you, I uh, three years ago, I think I I took part in the organization of a conference in São Paulo uh, of the pure data community, the open source software pure data, and I think. Uh, we, we had then a museum in Sao Paulo, which was then uh, devoted to technological art, and uh, this project more or less has been dismounted in Nice, Sao Paulo. But uh, when we made this convention of the pure data community, uh, an enormous amount of people went to the museum uh, as if it was a pop event. And so there are a lot of uh, small labs in Belo Horizonte, in Sao Paulo, a lot of places dealing with these uh, very cheap components like Raspberry Pi, um, the other Arduino, Arduino uh, and other uh, very cheap components which are completely uh, embedded in contemporary human culture now. So, uh, I think in a certain way, Rosalind Prowse and Vivian Abois, our book, they are resisting, they are making a piece of resistance against the emergence of digital culture as the, a new paradigm. Of course. This is the question. This is Not the question. question. So, so, yes, and digital culture has already won. It's one, but it hasn't won in the in the art war. Yes, it, uh, and I think that um, what's it, another demonstration of how digital culture has won? If you look at the number of citations, scholarly citations for Nicholas Burio book. Relational ethics, which is maybe the most influential theory of contemporary art in the last 10 years. There may be uh, maybe 600 citations now. This book is published in 1990, 99, something like that, uh, 96. Lev Manovich's Language of New Media published about the same time, has over 2,000 citations. So, um, yeah, digital culture is much bigger than the contemporary art world. Yes. It's much bigger, much much more widespread, much more highly cited in scholarly circles. And I think you're right, it, it's it's one in a certain respect. It's, it's, it's everywhere. And I think you're right that this old guard and the contemporary art world is trying to resist that. It's, it's like I said in the very beginning, it's an ideological battleground. Yes. And people are holding fast to their ideological beliefs, in part because they have a lot invested in them, and they're not open to other ideas. The commercial art world really is, I think, afraid of digital art because it threatens the traditional dissemination, distribution methods and the notion, the false notion of scarcity, of unique original objects. 
So just as the music industry has seen its the bottom taken out of it financially through aisle sharing, digital music, I think that the art world is really afraid of what the future will bring with digital art. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I, it's, it's, it's a matter of time. It, it's inevitable. I think what is at stake are the terms yeah, by which yeah. digital art enters into a mainstream contemporary art canon. We look at the history of photography. Uh, as John Tagg wrote in the late 90s, the photography be being collected by the Museum of Modern Art in New York in the 1930s a department, curatorial photography department, curatorial department of photography founded in the 40s. But the so photographs that were collected and exhibited were really very traditional photographs. They were photographs recapitulated, reinforced the conventional art historical canon. There were photographs that looked like the paintings that were already in the Museum of Modern Art. They were not the more experimental and more interesting and innovative forms of photography that were emerging as a result of the possibilities of this new medium. So my concern is that when new media art, as it enters into the mainstream contemporary art world, enters into museums, enters into the canon of art, that it's not the new media art that is most like existing contemporary art that reinforces the status quo, but it's a new media art that really challenges that. It, that's what's interesting to me about new media art and network culture, is the way that it contests and challenges and extends our understanding of what art is and what society is and can be. So I'm concerned that uh, new media art enter into mainstream contemporary art not on the terms of mainstream art, but on its own terms. Or on terms that are negotiated and debated to arrive at something that is some sort of synthesis that pushes contemporary art in meaningful ways, in new directions. I'm hearing something that um, just, can you hear? Is yes, I can hear. Yes. Yes. So, uh, so sometimes they can, for example, they they will make an exhibition, a photo exhibition, with uh, a lot of uh, people naked and, and doing things that uh, it uh, it attacks morality a lot. But uh, this is an example that uh, sometimes uh, someone, some curator that uh, that people know, say, "Oh, let's do this exhibition because this is photographer." on a road and, uh, and it's nice and it's this and it's that. And then they do, uh, if we show this kind of content to them, they will, uh, they will, I don't know, maybe call the psychiatrics or something. But uh, someone from, uh, someone trustable for them, show them something. And this person even don't know the content. And then they make an exhibition with uh, some pictures that attack the morality. And this is a, a case that happened here. Um, they approved some uh, projects, and after they said, oh my god, we cannot do this project. But what I'm talking about, yes, yes, because they know, it, it shows they, they are not looking into, into contents. Because they, they, cannot, they cannot deal with, uh, with the, the contents. And for art media and new technologies, it, it's even more complicated, I think, for them. Uh, I mean, I, I mean about the people who can uh, decide things. This is mm -hmm. one thing. 
another thing is, is general culture. General culture also, there are lots of things to, to analyze, but uh, it, I mean, it's the same thing. It's, it's power territory and it's resistance of market, and we have this resistance in many fields. You were talking about music, and it's, this is the, this is the thing. Someone wrote uh, the cure for cancer is already known, but uh, the, the people who make the medicines <laughs> are not interested to... Uh, this is one example, but this kind of world we live in, and this is the kind of uh, peaceful war we can make with creativity and be nice, nice, uh, nice propose and that uh, can involve people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. It's very difficult for uh, traditionally trained curators and critics to understand art involving digital technologies. I think that it demands uh, a different sort of theoretical framework, a different set of methodologies to really understand its meaning. And a lot of these people they are not familiar with that literature. They haven't read new media theory. They haven't. They don't understand uh, how it. It's history. They don't understand the history of of the field to be able to place it in a historical context. But that's just a matter of laziness. They need to do their homework. There was a, recently an article in Art Forum. By Claire Bishop, who is a very prominent art critic, professor in, in New York City, a frequent contributor to October Magazine, and she the, the article is called "Digital Divide," and she starts off by saying, "Whatever happened to digital art in the mid '90s? It seemed like it was going to be, you know, a big thing in the future, but..." but really hasn't entered into contemporary art discourses. And she says that she can name on the fingers of one hand the contemporary artworks that seriously contend with what it means to exist in digital culture, what the implications of this are for uh, human existence. Um, and that makes me think she can only count on the fingers of one hand, that's because she doesn't know. She hasn't done her homework. In fact, I wrote a whole book, plenty of examples of works using digital technologies to really seriously contend with what it means to exist in digital culture. But she just hasn't done the homework, and then she says that, well, there's this whole field of new media art, but that's a separate thing. So she, while she's trying to address the, no, the digital divide, what she in fact does is reinforce that very divide by separating these fields of practice rather than understanding continuities between them because of her own ignorance. So I think that it's a, and this is a very prominent critic. I'm sure you, you, you may know her work. So it's, it's a problem. It's very difficult. How do you overcome that that divide? The critics themselves who on the surface are trying to talk about that divide but are too ignorant, too uneducated about it to, to really deal with it in a serious way. And are content with reinforcing the divide. Uh, you talk a lot um, about uh, rewriting uh, history. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, you talk a lot about uh, rewriting history, and um, I wonder how was uh, your book uh, received uh, by the critics and uh, and by the uh, the art the art world. You know, because you you put your book in movements and themes. So uh, and how was that? reception. It was very well received. 
there have been over 20 reviews of the book. Um, it wasn't reviewed in Art Forum, but it was reviewed in Art America, favorably reviewed. It was reviewed uh, in a number of Spanish language uh, magazines. I don't think it was reviewed in, in uh, Brazil and Portu any Portuguese journals, but I might not be aware of it. Um, but it was very favorably reviewed. Very favorably reviewed. But just because it was favorably, favorably reviewed doesn't mean that prominent people like Claire Bishop have ever bothered to look at it or learn from it. At the same time, uh, it has had, I think, a positive influence on uh, helping to introduce this broad field of practice to large audiences. So uh, one of the artists in the book told me that uh, a collector who had acquired some of her work in the past um, saw the book and saw her work in the book and it made him think that her work was actually more valuable because it was in this book. Uh, that it was part of this larger canon, this larger art historical field. So uh, I think that that's valuable in and of itself, that if my writing can give value to the works that I'm writing about uh, and help people recognize its importance, then that's, that's a good thing. Yeah, and you were talking about Bouvier, you know, but uh, one of his last books, uh, it's uh, called Post Production. It's all dedicated to, you know, uh, to artists that work with post production. So uh, I know that relational statics is uh, it's a, it's a different way to look, but he was also like trying to look in some way to uh, post production you know, people that are working with materials that are already available, uh, right. mostly, you know, digitally. And also this um, uh, this talk about digital culture, and that's a, a little provocation to talk, is that uh, uh, how can we talk about uh, uh, digital culture if we are, what we are seeing is a process of digitalization of different cultures? Like everything is becoming digital now, so mm -hmm. uh, and then come comes back to your to your what you're saying about uh, photography entering the museums. So uh, and you also talk about the new media is not so new. You know, it's from the 40s. So how how is it going? How how can you see that situation going on? Well, I think it's. I think it's a process. Um, you know, there are many ways, in really deep, profound ways, that digital culture is, is global culture. The globalization and digitization have gone hand in hand. Um, world economics, world economic market are unimaginable without digital processes to facilitate the flow of capital and the exchange of capital. Um, but at the same time, it's not something that's all one thing or all another thing. There's not one culture. There are many cultures. There are many digital cultures, uh, as you're suggesting. And these cultures are not all digital. They're partly digital. My life isn't completely digital. But uh, I think it's as much a matter of an attitude a way of thinking as it is a way of connecting, uh, a way of being. I, th I, th I think of technology very much in terms of behavior, human behavior, social behavior, cultural behaviors. Um, they're not independent of people and institutions and cultures that use them and develop different ways of using them that are particular to those, those milieus, those contexts. So, I think we find ourselves in 
different parts of the world adopting digital cultures and uh, digital technologies and applying them in different ways, different forms of behaviors, different levels of uh, digitization, um, different uh, attitudes towards it. And it's, it's a process of uh, a hybridization and transformation. And uh, it's not completely saturated, and it may never be completely saturated. But it's it, and the, te the technologies and the behaviors are always changing uh, as new forms of interaction are desired and invented, and, and they evolve. So uh, I think it's very fluid, and I think it's that fluidity, that shifting. Uh, that malleability um, that is really very interesting and that art can play a significant role in. I'm, I'm very interested in how art can function as, to use the words of Jack Burnham, a psychic dress rehearsal for the future. How art can offer a context for a really critical reflection on technology and uh, social behaviors and uh, digital culture. So I think that uh, art need to use digital technology to offer useful critical reflections on it. But I think that the use of electronic media in and as art offers very special potentials for a metacritical reflection, using those technologies in a way that allows a form of critical reflection on them uh, that is inaccessible using conventional media, to turn those technologies in on themselves in a critical way. So there are, are many examples of this. One would be, uh, say, Google will eat itself. If you're familiar with this web project, they uh, set up a bunch of websites and used the Google AdSense uh, technology in order to get revenues using click-throughs with the ads. And with those revenues generated through the AdSense mechanism on Google, they bought shares of Google stock. And they were making money and progressively owning more and more of shares of Google so eventually they acquired something like $400,000 worth of Google stock. And they went from zero to $400,000. And at the rate of the increase, they ironically projected that by 200 million years, they would fully own Google. But I think what this work does is it turns the technology in on itself to consume the technology by using the technology. And I think that sort of critical reflection is something that can only be done by using the technology, that, sort of, that level of metacritical analysis. So I think that there's uh, a lot that can be done uh, in terms of uh, the way art helps us understand what's going on in the moment as things are shifting, as new cultural behaviors are emerging in relation to new technological forms um, and enabling us to have that sort of psychic dress rehearsal for the future. I, thought, uh, I have some pupils uh, about uh, uh, transmedia uh, workshop and they will, will like to, uh, to know if you have something uh, to say about um, uh, transmedia and alternative reality games, arts. Do you have some, uh, something in, to say? Uh, is uh, transmedia and uh, what was the next thing? Alternative reality games. Uh, the famous. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, no, no. Alternative reality games. Yes. It's a new type of new media. And, uh, <laughs> I arrived in Brazil a few times. 
no, uh, and the United States have a more discussions about this. Well, I think that um, there have been a number of artworks using augmented reality. They've both been adopted within institutional contexts as art exhibits. Uh, I was just talking to a friend last night who runs a public art um, uh, institution in Silicon Valley and they commissioned an augmented reality artwork for uh, as a public artwork. A public artwork that is invisible to the naked eye that can only be accessed using a smartphone or other mobile device using a QR code. Um, and it was difficult to convince the city that this was really a valid form of art, but they were able to. Uh, it's Silicon Valley, so that sort of thing is more accepted there. But there are also, I think, very interesting instances where artists have created more guerrilla augmented reality applications as art. So having uh, an alternative augmented reality exhibition that is superimposed on uh, a Biennale or some other mainstream art exhibit. And so I think that there are you know, these two ways that this can be approached, both within the institutional context, using the institution, or kind of an guerrilla approach, just superimposing it. You can have your exhibition, your augmented reality exhibition, anywhere you want to, anytime you want to. You don't need anyone's permission to do so. Um, as long as people can somehow, you know, be aware of it. And I think that's probably the bigger challenge. Making people aware that there is this other layer that they can access. But I think it's a really interesting field of, of uh, experimentation and growth. I had a, a student write his BA thesis uh, on augmented reality, and I think he, he wrote his, his master's thesis to augmented reality art. So I think it's a really interesting area of experimentation. It's also a commercial field, you know, where, where advertising is appearing in augmented reality and commercial interests are using this. Starbucks created an augmented reality application to promote their products. So we're I think that in order to use it in an artistic way, it needs to carve out a particular place for itself that goes above and beyond uh, the instrumental and commercial application that are already widely in circulation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I? I would like to. I think some just maybe one more question, and then I have to go. Okay. Uh, I'll make a, a just a small provocation. Okay. I think it's worth doing it. Uh, I think the, the the tension you're describing between your new media work and the old traditional art critics reflects uh, a division that we see in our world between the old media industry, books and CDs, etc., and the new corporations like Google and uh, Apple, etc., the new economy forces uh, connected to digital culture. Yeah. And, uh, I wonder if the question about art isn't uh, more better put if we discuss just with just good art and not so good art. And it doesn't matter if it is technological or not, because every work of art discusses the present. It works in the present, it's directed to people in the present, in our here and now times. So uh, is, is uh, it really a criteria of uh, Valuation of works of art, if it is new media or old media, or just 
uh, it, uh, it, uh, or is it expected to provide a valuable experience for us to understand ourselves and the present? Yes, I, I completely agree with you. I completely agree. There's a lot of really bad new media art, and there's a lot of really bad mainstream contemporary art. And there are good new media works and good contemporary traditional yes. art works. Yes. And they the, help the problem is, the world. Uh, I, I organized a panel discussion for Art Basel in 2010. And on the panel was Nicholas Burio and Peter Weibel and an artist, Michael Gray, who works between new media and mainstream art. And Nicholas Burio drew a very clear distinction between the explicit use of digital technology and the implicit use of digital technology. And he embraced the implicit use of digital technology and he rejected the explicit use of it. Peter Weibel, very astutely, I think, uh, responded to this saying that this was an unfair prejudice and he called it media injustice. And I think that there is a pervasive media injustice in the mainstream contemporary art world. And we see this also in the Claire Bishop article, which just said, okay, well, there's this whole area of new media art, but we're not going to talk about that. So I agree with you. If we could talk just about art in general, who cares what media it's made out of? I'm all in favor of that. But there are a lot of people who refuse to do that. Who are making these distinctions and not accepting, not really seriously addressing work that explicitly uses digital technologies as a medium. So I think part of the problem is that how do we evaluate good art in general. How do we evaluate good art, particularly good art that uses explicit use of digital technologies when the discourses of art criticism and art history do not employ interpretive methods that allow an understanding of the content or the form of those works. So I think that the discourses of art criticism and art history really need to expand to engage other theoretical methods. And there are many examples through history of art history, art history doing this, accepting Marxist theory in terms of the analysis of labor and material culture, and uh, accepting feminist theory in order to understand issues of gender post-colonial theory, semiotics, post-structuralism. So there's no reason why art history and art criticism can't expand their methodological toolkit to include the history and philosophy of science, new media theory, and other related theories that would enable them to really understand and evaluate, to judge fairly, art that uses new media explicitly and implicitly. But right now, that's not the case. And until that is the case, I'm afraid that that uh, art made with the explicit use of new media will continue to be subject to media injustice. Thank you. But we can change that. <laughs> We can create our own form of writing history. Yeah, but this is in an alternative brain domain. We can reach more people online than they can reach with books. More people are citing Lev Manovich than are citing Nicholas Burria. So I think that there are there's grounds for optimism in trying to uh, create alternative histories and challenge the mainstream histories and the mainstream uh, forms for writing and disseminating history. Okay. Uh, one last uh, almost observation.
observation. Doesn't mean that this is a question. But uh, it seems for, you, for me uh, very, uh, uh, very coherent that when you, when you talk about rewriting, that, we are, that, that you are talking about rewriting, making a history and a digital platform, as you showed us with the uh, art and electronic media online. And uh, do you expect this history will be sufficiently fluid for the next years? Because we are used to see history as something like a concrete uh, object that stays there, doesn't change in the past, uh, only the present and maybe with some hope in the future. So uh, my provocation is, how fluid would you um, expect, wish, and, uh, and, and uh, permit the history that you are rewriting to be in considering the digital platform and the i-materiality ubiquity and, uh, and uh, uh, and flexibility for interventions of this platform? Uh -huh. That's a really good question. And it's a difficult question to answer. Um, because I want history to be flexible and fluid and to allow the diversity of perspectives to be represented, and I like to allow shin and tension to exist, uh, and for history to benefit from uh, the resolution or the things that occur through that. At the same time, I think it's also important for there to be rigorous standards. So, any it's not that anything goes. I think that uh, things need to be substantiated. There need to be uh, uh, standard, evaluative procedures. Now, this exists on Wikipedia, for example. They have a very elaborate mechanism for uh, monitoring and editing uh, and uh, maintaining uh, the accuracy of uh, articles. And it's not perfect, but it allows a fluidity of the creation of content and the uh, uh, revision of content, updating of content, introduction of new content uh, that is really good. And in some ways, you will find the most accurate information on a topic on Wikipedia. Because once something published in a book, if it's wrong, it will always be wrong in that book. But Wikipedia can correct that instantaneously. So I think the challenge really lies in enabling information, history to be written and rewritten, be corrected, revised, debated, discussed, um, but also to be uh, have some sort of mechanism for ensuring accuracy and uh, rigor in uh, the writing of history. And I'm not sure the best way to provide that. Uh, currently, the online companion is all manually edited. And that's a laborious process. And it's a very challenging process, particularly for me, to do in languages that I don't read or write. So. Um, I'm open to suggestions for how to improve that process. But I think that increasingly people are open to, uh, the, to fluid platforms for digital historical writing, for encyclopedic uh, production that is authoritative, that is recognized as valid that you could cite in a scholarly article. And I think that that will increase. And I think that the mechanisms for assuring accuracy and scholarly rigor of these things will also 
improve and increase. But I think that it increases and improves the more people who are involved in the process. So it's really important to get a critical mass of people involved who are actually engaged in that process of revision and supervision and editing. Um, so that's that's the best answer I have for you. Thank you so much. It's